Happy Sabbath once again. Happy Sabbath. And 4th of July is Independence Weekend, and I pray that we all stay safe, that we all keep our fingers, and that we enjoy the fireworks, but do it safely. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the road to Emmaus as we saw the disciples walking with Jesus. He kept himself hidden from them. And the point that we emphasized was that Jesus is in Moses, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, all things concerning himself, that the word of God from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus Christ. There is no sense in learning doctrine unless that doctrine leads you into a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. And then last week, we looked at specific examples in the Old Testament. We looked at the gospel in Genesis 3.15, and we looked at the blood of Abel shed as a minor representation of the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us that testifies better than the blood of Abel. We looked at Noah's Ark and the fact that Jesus is really our Ark of Comfort. We looked at cities of refuge, the story of Esther, the story of Mephibosheth, that name I have trouble pronouncing. And all of that pointed, these individual stories all pointed of the intercessory and salvific work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But today we're going to look at the Old Testament, but we're going to look at it from a standpoint of a system in the Old Testament that also gives us insight into the work of Jesus Christ. In that system, you and I know it as a sanctuary system. See, many people realize, and we realize, that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But they come to that realization and then dismiss the Old Testament sanctuary system, not knowing that that system tells us all about the work that Jesus Christ is doing in reality. That that system is a show and tell of the work that Jesus Christ is doing in your life and in my life in this very day, this very present hour, and in this time of earth's history. So with that being said, I want you to open your Bibles, not to the Old Testament, though, to John chapter 19, verse 30. There's one specific phrase I want to look at in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 30. The Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 30. The background of this chapter, he's hanging on the cross. He is about to expire. He's about to give up his spirit. And in verse 30, it says this. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sorrow of life, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. He was declaring the completion of a great work. The purpose for which he had come to earth. The phrase, it is finished, signifies the completion of a task. And, and in this context, it refers to the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies and the accomplishment of God's plan for the salvation of humanity. Jesus' death on the cross was a final perfect sacrifice alluded to in the old sanctuary by the lambs required to atone for the sins of humanity. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial system involved the offering of animals to atone for sins, but these sacrifices were only temporary and had to be repeated day by day, year by year. Jesus, however, served as the ultimate and final sacrifice. His death paid the price for all sins once and for all. So when Jesus said, it is finished, he meant the work of redemption was completed. He had accomplished the mission for which he had been sent by God, providing a way for humanity to be reconciled with God. This marked the end 
of the need of any further sacrifice for sin and open the way for all people to come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. The purpose of God in the history of man was accomplished at the cross, laying the foundation for the creation of children in his own image and glory. Peter tells us that we will be one day partakers of the divine nature. It is finished. However, if it is finished, then why are we still here? Why do we still suffer? If it is finished, then why do babies still die? Or why do we lose our parents? If it is finished, why do I suffer pain and hurt and ultimately will one day die myself? If it is finished and these questions remain unanswered, then something deeper must be taking place when Jesus cried out, it is finished. Now I'm going to use a couple of illustrations and none of these are perfect, so don't come to me after church and say, look, there's something flawed with your illustration. These aren't perfect, but they will give you the picture. And let's start with the fact that we are celebrating what holiday this weekend? The 4th of July, which is what? What is it celebrating? Independence, right? And so think about the soldiers, the people who decided that it was time to have our own independence, to form a government that is different from anything else. They planned, they fought a war, and they finally won that war to declare to the world, then known world, that we will be our own independent nation, that we will charter our own path creating a new government separate from that from England. And so when they won that war, that's it. That's all they had to do. Is that what happened? No, they won the war. They won their independence. But the journey was just getting started. Right? Think of a woman who desires, my wife and I, we suffered for three and a half years trying to get pregnant. And the moment we got pregnant, well, not me, she got pregnant. <laughs> The moment she was pregnant, we, we, we cried there as we knelt and thanked God. And for nine months, we were worried as Hannah was growing in the womb. And finally, the baby was born, and we just said, okay, we're done. We've achieved. <laughs> Trust me, it's been eight years with Hannah, and, and, it, and it just got started when she was delivered. Right? The pregnancy was finished. She was born. It was finished. The pregnancy was done. But no, no, no. Life continued. There was still more. The pregnancy was done. But life continued. When a car maker finishes a car, it's completed. For the, it's completed. The car is painted. It's ready for delivery. But has the car finished its purpose? No, a car isn't made just to be completed and sitting on a lot. It's meant to be driven by a family or a person or an individual. Finally, until it runs down and it's fulfilled its purpose. You can have it be finished in one aspect, but still not completed in the other. And so when Jesus cried out, it is finished. I want you to know that the victory over sin and Satan was guaranteed. Amen. When he cried out, it is finished, the devil was done, kaput, his fate is sealed. He may not have received the sentencing yet, like in courtroom, you may be found guilty, but the sentencing may be a week or months or even perhaps, you know, much later than that. His fate is sealed. When Jesus Christ on the cross cried out, it is finished, you and I can be assured that he who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it until that day. And there is no turning back for Satan and his legions because Jesus has guaranteed the victory when he stepped and died on the cross for you and me. God's work on the cross guaranteed us the victory, but the 
benefits of that victory are past, present, and yet future. And I want to highlight that today by looking at the Old Testament sanctuary. If you could put up the sanctuary in the back. <clears throat> so here we have the Old Testament sanctuary, as most of you perhaps know if you don't know. The way this whole process began, this systematic theology of this show and tell of, all, of what I like to call it, of the plan of salvation, is that you as a sinner had to, you were living around the courtyard, you had to, if you lived in the very back up to a quarter of a mile walk, walking with your lamb until you got to where the arrow is and you told the priest that you wanted to offer a lamb for your sins. And many of us don't understand, and this is going to come up because this is going to be a three-part sermon, that the priest never cut the throat of the lamb for you. You had to put your weight of your hands on the lamb and slit the throat yourself, signifying that it was your sins and my sins, the sins of the world that crucified our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. You have to take personal responsibility for the sins that hung our God on the cross. And so there you would come to the beginning, and there you would sacrifice the man. The priest, who in this case represents Christ, would take the blood, put the dead animal on the altar, and that represented the altar, this altar here. Because there's another altar represented the cross of Jesus Christ in the plan of salvation. At that point in the sanctuary service, Jesus cries out, It is finished. There, when the Lamb of God, who was slain from the foundation of the world, there when he cried out, It is finished, what starts there at this altar. But what has become a reality in the cross of Jesus Christ, you in your personal life and in the life of this world collectively, started what I call the engine to the plan of salvation. Once that engine began roaring, there is no turning back. Because Jesus, our high priest, who cannot fail, who has never lost a victory, who if you stay faithful to him will bring you all the way home, begins to mediate that blood into the sanctuary, the holy place, then into the most holy place. And when we end this three-part series, we will end it in Leviticus 16, which is the Day of Atonement. And we will match that up with what happens in the book of Revelation and finally the final judgment of the wicked and the righteous, which Levitic, I mean, Leviticus 16 points to. But now this engine has started in your life when you have accepted his sacrifice and in the collective lives of humanity. Now he is applying the blood. And I want you to open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1. I need a Bible, right? Because I don't like that I have to use glasses. So I need a Bible that looks like this, but that I can like zoom in and out. Because I don't like having an iPad Bible. You can do that. I don't like something that looks like this, and then I can zoom in. But when it's this small, you know what? I need a Big letter edition Bible. <laughs> verse, chapter 1, verse 4. Then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man of yours brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd of the flock. If it's an offering, it's a burnt offering from the herd. He shall offer it a male without defect. He shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. He, speaking of the individual, shall lay his head on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. We are going to read till verse 9. He shall slay the young boy before the Lord. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall offer up the blood and sprinkle the blood around the altar. 
that is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. He shall then skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons the priest shall arrange the pieces, the head and the fat over the wood, which is on the fire that is on the altar. Its entrails, however, its legs, he shall wash with water. And the priest shall offer up and smoke all of it on the altar for a burnt offering, and an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. And so you begin to see this process that takes place here. But today, what we're looking at is just this first phrase when Jesus cried out, It is finished, when the reality that this pointed to became a reality not only in your life and my life, but the life of the world. But this sanctuary service was done daily. And every year there was one special day called the Day of Atonement, and that represented something that is a reality in our lives. And we're not going to speak about that today, but I want to point that out because this that was done daily represents something specifically in your life and in the life of humanity. I want you to open your Bibles to Leviticus, same book, but chapter 6. Chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6. Verses 9, 12, and 13. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 9 says, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law for the burnt offering. The burnt offering itself shall remain on the hearth on the altar all night until the morning. And the fire on the altar is to be kept burning on it. Verses 12 and 13. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out, but the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall lay out the burnt offering on it, and offer up in smoke the fat portions of the peace offerings on it. Fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. And why? Because in the imperfect model of the sanctuary, that fire continually burning represents that our Lord and Savior, when he cried out, it is finished, is continually applying the merits of his sacrifice in your life. That he is forever making intercession for us. Never does he stop. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. For all his life, he is pleading and he is applying the merits of his blood for all those who are willing to come to the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But can you see how messy this is? Day by day, this blood being poured out. Day by day, the blood being taken into the veil of the most holy place, signifying that we are to come boldly to the throne of grace to lay down our sins, that we don't need a man to intercede for us. We have our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we don't need a priest, that we don't need a pastor that you have to go through. You can come boldly to the throne of grace Amen. where Jesus is God and the Father is God. And as Adventists, we are familiar with the sanctuary and we look at it. But sometimes we don't emphasize that this daily ritual that had the one day of the Day of Atonement signifies the reality of the timeline of humanity, of humanity's history. This day-to-day -day illustration was just to show and tell that when Christ began, his sacrificial work, when he cried out, it is finished, it was, be, it was bringing to light the reality that this pointed. And everybody in the Old Testament was saved by the future work of Christ. You and I are saved by what he did for us in the past. But this, this right here, this day-by-day -day ritual, they culminated on the Day of Atonement and then started again after the Day of Atonement, highlighting two things. One, your life and mine. You have accepted Jesus Christ or you have not. You're either outside in your blood, and the blood of Christ is not applied to your forgiveness of sins because you haven't asked them, but I'm going to take it for granted 
I'm talking to us today, right? We have all accepted the blood of Jesus Christ. So he has started, and he is applying the merit, and he is faithful to complete it until that day when he comes back in glory. However, those of us in the medical field, of which I'm not, but I'm married to a doctor, but I'll give you an illustration that happened with my wife and myself. The very first month I became the official pastor here, this September will be two years. I don't know if some of you remember that we had to rush Leah to the hospital. We thought she was having an appendicitis attack, and we rushed her to the hospital, and we rushed her to the nearest hospital. Well, while Leah was in the hospital, my wife started contacting friends and people in her inner circle of medical professionals, and they told her, whatever you do, do not let them operate your daughter in that particular hospital. So with the little thing still in her vein and, and identifications wrapped all around her, my wife picked up Leah and left that hospital. <laughs> And that, in medical terms, is called against medical advice, right? Again, a AMA. I asked my wife this morning, and I still forgot. <laughs> against AMA, right? Against medical advice. And we took her downtown to a better hospital, and it turned out she didn't have appendicitis. And she was fine. But we left against medical advice. Jesus has promised and guaranteed you the victory at the cross. When he cried out, it is finished. If we stay in him, the victory is assured. You may get there limping like the thief on the cross, or you may get there glorious like Elijah, never seeing death or like Enoch, but you will get there, not by your own merits, but by the merits of Jesus Christ crying out, it is finished. That being said, though, my God is a gentleman, and he will not force you to stay. And you will not receive the merits of the sacrifice if you leave against Christ's advice or against Christ's medical advice or healing advice. In other words, he's not going to force you. So this system applies. You are saved as long as you remain in Christ. But it's not, uh, I'm saved today, I sinned, I'm lost. I'm saved today. I... No, 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 no. This partakes over your whole life. Only your death decides, or well, Christ decides, but only in death does your eternal home become finalized. And the only one who knows that, praise God, it's not your pastor, it's not your elders, it's not your spouse or your children, but the one who has promised to judge faithfully will not the judge of the earth do what's right. And he decides when your life is done, did he trust in me, or did he trust in self? And if he trusted in me, no one can take him out of my hand, or her out of my hand. As we've been told in the book Steps to Christ, it's not an occasional good deed, or an occasional bad deed, but the trajectory of your life that determines where you will spend eternity. So this sanctuary ritual that was done daily and culminating in the Day of Atonement was a reminder that we have to remain, that we remain by faith outside of the sanctuary, but by faith accept that the blood is making it all the way to the throne. And the reality is that when it was the sanctuary, there was no guarantee outside of faith that Jesus was going to come, live, and die for our sins. But once that became a reality, he could cry out, it is finished. And it's a reality in your life and in mine. However, not only individually, this also has a corporate meaning, corporate meaning for humanity. It's the same thing. This planet is rotating and headed to an ultimate decision. Jesus will come back again in glory. But this time he's not a coming to address sin, he's coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
And in the Day of Atonement, of which we will see later on in this series, when your fate was decided on that day, if you did not have your sins at the throne of grace blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ, then, then you are held accountable for your own sins, and you will pay the penalty for your own sins. So the world is headed towards a judgment day. There will be a day of atonement for this world as there was in the Leviticus sanctuary. And God is using us and calling us to call people into a faith-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why I love Revelation 18, 14, where he says, yelling towards Babylon, come out of her, my people, so that you do not receive a her place. God identifies with people still in the world. He calls them my people. He's inviting them daily through his forever interceding for us to come home and to apply the blood of Jesus Christ in their lives. So not only does it have an individual application, it has an application for the world. And each of us gets to decide where we want to spend eternity. Will you bring your sacrifice if you were in Israel to the sanctuary for the forgiveness of sins? Now we don't have to carry a lamb. Now we don't have to carry an animal sacrifice. In the closet of our home, in the despair of our lives, we can cry out to the one who is eagerly listening for any son or daughter who is crying out to bring them back into a faith saving relationship to reconcile them with God that they may have eternal life. He cried out in his finish. I know in whom I believe. And I know my mansion is secure. I know that I will follow him wherever he may be. Not because there's any strength in me but because he had told us that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and troubling, for it is him that gives us the power both to will and to do for his great glory. So as we enter the sanctuary, will you accept them in your life? Will you turn on that engine to the powerful plan of salvation? See, Jesus Christ has promised us that he who began the good work in you is faithful to complete until that day. We just have to endure. Yes, it is finished. Yes, there's still sin and suffering. Yes, it is finished. And yes, we still lose parents. Yes, it is finished. And we still suffer pain and hurt and ultimately die. But if I die, the very next face I'll see is the face of the Lamb of God who took away my sins and threw in the depths of the sea. That's in whom I trust. That's whom I serve. Independence Day was declared that Friday on the cross, that dark Friday. Independence was declared. He has destroyed the kingdom of Satan, and the kingdom of God is open as far as the east is from the west, and all are invited to come in. All are invited to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All you have to do is trust the merits of Jesus Christ. And the darker it gets, and it will get dark, just cling more to the hand of your Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your amazing love. I thank you for crying out, it is finished. The victory is guaranteed. But Father, as we will see in the next couple of weeks, we'll learn exactly what's taking so long how your sanctuary system gives us insight into what you're doing as we wait. 
Thank you, though, for guaranteeing each and every one of us to victory in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.